26 to 28, that's where we're, we're on the back side of that sheet, and then we'll move on to the next, hopefully. Or not, you know? Are, are you guys in a, are anybody in a hurry? I had somebody's like, oh, we're still in Ezekiel. I'm just going to stop coming. I'm like, well, I'm sorry you're bored with God's word. Don't say that. All right. So some of the advantages to the screen, I told you this before we bought it, but it's been so long you probably don't remember. Uh, this is what I generally do over in the classroom. So if I want to emphasize something, uh, like, for example, we're going to look at the words here, you, 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 but then I, I, right? So I can do things like that. I can point out. Right? Yeah. Plus, you can probably just see it. I mean, that's nice, right? If I use the computer, I could go the full width, but it's fine. What's up? Oh, yeah. That, no, I, I knew that that... Mike said we could go up another... What did he say? It could go up another inch, maybe, but I don't think... I don't think it needs to be any higher, as long as you can see over the thing. I mean, would it be better if I had this on the other side? Probably, right? But now I'm going to have to think left-handed. I can help. Okay. Well, I prefer to use the tablet because I can walk around with it then. If it was a laptop, I wouldn't do that. Because so. the laptop would go the full width, but that's fine. What? Oh, hi. Good to see you too. So remember last time we talked, we had um, actually three chapters of judgment against the city of Tyre, which seemed a little bit, what, excessive <laughs> and peculiar, right? But, uh, but we kind of, it actually sets us up pretty well for Egypt, because Egypt, we're going to have even, Egypt has seven oracles of judgment against it. So Tyre, Tyre and Sidon, you know, is used like as a pejorative by Jesus in the gospel. When he speaks, he speaks, you know. It would be great. It's, yes, hi. It's better for Tyre and Sidon than it will be for you in the day of judgment, he says. And that's like an insult to them, right? Yeah. And then, uh, of course, last week we had that remarkable uh, moment where the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And, uh, you know, you have Jesus as the, the house upon the rock. And the rock is, of course, the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. And that's in contrast to the city of Tyre, who they built their house on a rock, but it's the rock of their own, what? Strength and power and majesty and wealth, right? Which makes you think maybe the rock is on the same. Yes, ironically, the rock that they built it on ends up under Alexander the Great ends up becoming just sand. That's true. I mean, he builds a land bridge out to it, right? I use that metaphorically. I like your metaphor. What? Hi. Okay. So let's review uh, chapter 28. The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, say to the prince of fire, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is proud and you have said, I am God, I sit in the seat of God, in the heart of the seas. Yet you are but a man, no God, though you make your heart like the heart of God. You are indeed wiser than Daniel. No secret is hidden from you. By the wisdom of your understanding, you have made wealth for yourself, and have gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom and your trade, you have increased your wealth, and your heart has become proud in your wealth. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you make your heart like the heart of God, therefore, behold, I will bring foreigners upon you, the most ruthless of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall press you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain, in the heart of the seas. Will you still say, I am God, in the presence of the Lord, will you? Though you are but a man, no God, in the hands of those who slay you. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of foreigners. For I have spoken, declares the Lord God. All right. A few things we need to review. We read that last week, but uh, just to review it. You notice, what is the king of Tyre being judged? I mean, why is he being judged? What's the basis of his judgment? What has he done? He's made himself out to be a god, right? And that idolatry can look, take a lot of different kind of uh, forms, right? It could be power, right? Bow before me, blah, 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 right? Kneel, Kneel yeah. Um, or it could be wealth in this case. It's like, look, if you want to do business in the Mediterranean, you're going to have to deal with the seafaring nations along the coast, right? And it was the Philistines, now it's Tyre and Sidon. 
I mean, they're the ones who manage the seas and they're the port that you have to trade through in order to get to land. So he who controls the ports controls the seas ultimately, right? This is why China bought all the ports on the West Coast. All right, even though they don't have the Navy to protect them. Um, so he's put his trust in himself ultimately, right? Because he's made himself a God. And the way that he's made that manifest to the world is through all of the gold and silver and what else did it say? Riches, right? Silver in the treasury, gold and silver. By the way, precious metals, nice store of value. <laughs> I was watching a video yesterday about buying what they call junk coins. Have you heard of this? Pre-1965 um, U.S. Treasury coins that had silver in it, like, the, like quarters. Even though it's only 90% silver, because you can actually, use, it's already minted, so you can still use it to transact. You just don't transact based off the face value. You transact off based off the weight value. Rather, I mean, are you going to exchange goods with bars of silver? Do you know how to, how to mint silver into coins? No. So it's, it's helpful. It's already in coins. But anyway, uh, store of value. And then uh, what else does he have? Oh, he's, he's so wise, right? With your wisdom. No secret is hidden. And then there's, I think this is sarcastic. You are wiser than Daniel. This is something I couldn't do before. I can, yeah, I can point at the words. Yeah, he flips the U and the R and instead of that explanation where he puts his question, so it says, are you wiser than Daniel? Right, exactly. It's ambiguous. Yeah, I like it, I like it that way as a more of a sarcastic statement. Some say it's not. It doesn't matter. I mean, he is wise. I mean, obviously as far as earthly wisdom goes, or he wouldn't have such a great trading empire and have all this wealth and prosperity, right? You know? Um, but of course, does that kind of save him? No, because he's judged in a very particular way. And uh, God brings na strangers against him, the most terrible of the nations, right? Which will be first Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, and then it will be the Greeks under Alexander the Great. Ptol what do they call it? The Ptolemaic Empire? Is that what they call it? Alexander's Empire? I don't know. The Greeks. And they'll draw their swords. Notice, what, what is the beauty of your wisdom against the sword? Oh, you have all that stuff. All right, fine, we'll take that. <laughs> we have swords. Uh, and they'll defile. So now we're getting this language of sacred and profane, right? So he's made himself out to be a god. And what happens to his godliness, his holiness? His Holiness, the King of Tyre, he's defiled, right? Like you would a god. Um, that's what, uh, by the way, that's what uh, the judges often did. I'm thinking of Samson is particular. He defiles the temple of Dagon, right? Where the statue falls over. And actually, that happened before yeah. Samson was there. And then Samson came and brought the whole place down. He raised the roof, so to speak. Uh, and actually, the opposite. Whatever the opposite is. Um, then this is an interesting expression. I don't know if I gave you a note about this, but they shall throw you down into the pit. Dun, 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 right? So in the Bible, we have a lot of names for places um, describing like uh, idea of the underworld. Did I give you a note about it? The pit? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's the second full paragraph, right? The oracle shifts. Yahweh judges the king. Oh, that comes up next. Never mind. But it's here too. All right, so I'm getting ahead of myself. The pit, another word for hell, in other words. In the Old Testament, you have Sheol, which is the place of the dead that are waiting the resurrection. We would call that the grave, right? And then you have hell, which of course prepared for the devil and his angels. Um, and then you, in the New Testament, you also get the Greek word from the Greek mythology of Hades as a word for hell, place of, of judgment. Right? And you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. So now the pit's at the bottom of the ocean, which is fitting for the king of Tyre with his seafaring you know, wealth, right? That you'd be buried at the bottom of the sea. You know. uh, by the way, you heard in the psalm today the inverse of this. What? Where's my... Oh, I could just go there, right? All right. We'll just use the Bible on the screen. Our psalm today was Psalm... Not the intro, it. 103. 103. Yeah, notice this. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Right? He will not always try. He dealt with us according to our sin. He's not dealt with us according to his sins, nor punished us according to his iniquities. 
right? And then look at what happens. Where was the pit in this? There was the pit. Did I miss the pit part? Didn't we sing about going down to the pit? We did. Is it not? Is it a different translation here? Sorry. I thought it was in the psalm. Was it in? Oh, maybe it was in the intro. It. All right, intro it then. I was going to show you something from the psalm, but who knows what psalm? Oh yeah, there it is. Yeah. So this is kind of. <laughs> We didn't read all of this because the intro, it only has little bits and pieces, right? The pangs of death surrounded me. The floods of ungodliness made me afraid. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. We had this in the psalm. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple. A cry came even to his ears. All right. And then look at this. Here it is. He made the darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of um, the skies. This sounds like the judgment going against... Tire, right? Because it sounds like the seafaring judgment. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. Ooh, is that asteroids? I guess. All right, more rebuke, more judgment, right? And then, unlike the king of Tyre, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me and was too strong for me. All right. Well, we sang about the pit today. Or we said something about the pit, but I lost it. Somebody find the pit from today. Let's go back to our text. All right. Or not. And uh, then, will you still say before him who slays you, I am a God? You see? Uh, or as the psalm says, who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and forgiving sins. All right? Who is a God like you? And is there a God like him? What's the answer? No. That's correct. Right? And now you have the same sort of judgment here. Are you a God? No. You shall be a man, a puny God, if you like, and not a God in the hand of him who slays you. And we talked about this last week. Apparently, strange story, Tyre and Sidon are circumcising. Where'd they learn that? From the Hebrews, that's right. Yep. Right? So they've been circumcised. Why would they do that? Same, same reason why people generally have their kids baptized. <laughs> then they never show up again in church. I was like, uh, what do you want to say? It's a, it's a thing to do. Well, we're just going to cover that base. Yeah. As if circumcision without the promise means anything. Right? Without the word, what is circumcision? Well, pain and a lucrative business enterprise as well. They make a lot of money off all that foreskin. The hospitals do. They don't, tell, they don't pay you back for it. They should pay you for it based off the amount of money they make off of it. Anyway, uh, by the hand of the aliens, foreigners. For I have spoken, says the Lord God. All right, we did that last week. Now let's keep going. Moreover, that wasn't enough. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, Take up the lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardines, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Right. You were the anointed chair who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Till iniquity was found in you. Mm-hmm. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupt your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Mm-hmm. 
You defile your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trade. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst, did devour you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. In the sight of all who saw you, all who knew you among the peoples was astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Oof. All right. So um, this is kind of an odd, odd little uh, lamentation, right? Usually lamentations aren't quite so tongue-in-cheek. But that's how I think you want to think of this. Um, call it sarcasm if you want, or a parody even, because it's a mock lamentation. I mean, why would you lament the death of the unbelievers? Well, that they would repent and live, right? But that's not what happens here, that they would have repented. No, he's lamented as if the king of Tyre was a true God and that he had entire, the city of Tyre was a, was a temple and that they had all the religious rites and ceremonies. And a lot of these things mimic what you have heard of that God has appointed, right? Right. So it's not, so now this lament is his judgment as, as a God and of his temple and of all of his worship and his ceremonial garb, right? Cause you had the, at the beginning you had the, the stones, which were fun to say, right? Right. Yeah, look at you. And again, this is what Judah was, but now it's being applied to Tyre. Same thing. Actually, the same judgment happened to Judah, but that was because they rebelled against God, right? This is because he's, he's uh, what do you want to say, a faker? He's mimicking? I've tried to point this out to you over the last couple of years, um, but beware of religious language. It means li- listen for it. Once you, once you get your ears tuned into it, you'll recognize that people co-opt the language of faith, but they use it for their own personal gain. What do I mean by that? Not just invoking the name of God. That's obvious, right? You know, or saying, I'm a Roman Catholic, and you don't, but you don't actually live or act like one, right? You don't follow the teachings of the church. That's obvious. Now, what I'm talking about is when you take something that's not faith in Christ, not his holy church that he's instituted, or not even his sacraments, but you take all that language and you bring it into another context. Specifically nationalism, right? Our nation has done this. We have holy halls, the hallowed halls of Congress. Like, they're not holy. Yes, they're set apart by our country for Congress people again, right? But those are not priests, right? Um, Nancy said that, that, they, that the January 6th protesters desecrated it. Like, that's the, it's not sacred. They didn't desecrate anything. I mean, maybe they broke an entry, but... <laughs> uh, although, I mean, there is a sense that we have that, uh, to be fair. Uh, if somebody violates your home, right? You have a robber, right? Or something terrible happens in your home. I mean, you might actually leave. You, may not, you might just move because you're like, I can't be in this place where that happened, right? Or where I don't feel safe and secure anymore. Fair enough, right? Yeah. And that's a sense of desecration or... or um, um, shame, maybe. Um, but, but you'll watch this. It's like, they want to be worshipped, is my point. Or they would, that's why they use worship language. Does that make sense? Trust us. Trust the experts. That's, another, that's a whole another priestly class, right? Those who have the sacred book of knowledge, like the sacred wisdom of, of the king of Tyre. Well, look at what all his wisdom got him. He's at the bottom of the sea. Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. But that's obvious. Yeah, I remember famously before, uh, before COVID, it was Creflo Dollar, who has the best name for an evangel- TV evangelist. Dollar is in your name. That kind of tells you probably maybe what your motive is. But he's like, you know, I got I to do all this flying around. I need a new jet. You know, so we got to raise $7 million. You're like, I know you want to get there quickly because you got a lot of places to go, but $7 million? Can you buy a used model? Yeah, anyway. Yeah, no, it's true. And we can be judgmental about that. But we don't want to fall into the trap of Judas, though, who, like, mocked, um, you know, Mary when she broke that alabaster flask of precious ointment to anoint Jesus' feet for the day of his burial, he says. And he's like, oh, we could have, you know, we could have sold that and given the money to the poor. We're not really sure if he would have done that, given that he was a thief, as the evangelist says. But all the same, you know, we can't spend that money on the church because we could use it to go feed the hungry. Why well, then go feed the hungry with it? Right, but the reality is 
no, you're not doing that either. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so we had to be careful about kind of that Judas um, ethic, I guess you'd call it. So, what were we saying? Oh, about Creflo Dollar, right? Yeah, if he needs a jet, he, needs, he gets a jet. Everybody gets a jet. Yeah. Oh, that's a different religious figure. Her name is Oprah. I think, I think we've already made this uh, Did we? Um, comparison or um, similarities here, but there's a lot of talk in here that reminds me of like Satan being cast down. From yeah, we're, well, we were going to talk about that. Sure. Yeah, I just haven't gotten there yet. All right. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Like, where would that come from? But remember, Eden is the first temple. Dwelling place of God with man. They walked in the cool of the day. The objects, the trees were the objects, I mean, you, of, of love, right? You took care of the garden. This was guard, God's garden, right? You were safe and secure, like the church. This is why church architecture mimics the, the picture of a grove. Have I talked about this before? In the old buildings, you had the columns. Those are trees. And then you have the canopy ceiling. That's the boughs of the tree. And you're in the, you're in the garden. And, and they're often painted that way. Yeah, we had that in Chicago, the vacancy I served. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. You think it's a little bit like excessive. They're just trying to make it like a well-ordered garden. Like we're back in Eden again. Don't. That's, you have your book, she has hers. Okay. Um, well, how's he dressed? He's got, remember the 12, smooth, the 12 stones? The ephod, the breastplate of the high priest? So we're bringing together all sorts of things here. I think Ezekiel is just... He's just like having fun. <laughs> and he's riffing on all sorts of stuff and bringing it in. Right? Temples and pipes also. That's for temple, tabernacle worship. Um, oh, you're the cherub, the anointed angel. Right? And you're on. Oh, well, we might as well bring in the holy mountain of God with Moses. We already had Eden. We already had the tabernacle. Now we have um, the mountain of God, which is also a picture of the temple or the dwelling place of God with man. Right? You have the fiery... What is walking back and forth in the midst of fiery um, stones? I have a note that says possibly the stars. Oh, okay. Heaven, which made me think, oh, maybe oh look at you as you're transversing the heavens. It's mockery, right? Yeah, the king of Tyre, he's stuck on a little, little hole on the, in the middle of the water. You were perfect. You were perfect. <laughs> you see how it's going here? Yeah. Until... Uh-oh... Iniquity was found in you. Um, I think you're right, though. This does sound like he's being pictured. Like I, I have notes on here. Yeah, yeah. You were on the mountain, and then you were cast down, right? And a cherub, an angel, hmm, who's cast out of the garden. Hmm. So it does seem like the king of Tyre is being a picture of Satan. And so this this will be helpful when we hit this in the gospel. Uh, and Jesus says, "I saw Satan fall like lightning." And you're like, well, "Where did you what?" I don't remember that story. <laughs> right? Think of this, Ezekiel 28, 11 to 19. Okay? Um, yep, you were filled with violence from within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God or the dwelling place of God, heaven. Sound familiar? Yeah, I think this is fair enough. I destroyed you, O covering cherub. Again, what are cherubs? The cherubim? They're worshiping angels. Yeah. Yeah, generally not, not mess, they're not messenger angels, generally. That's different. There seems to be different categories of angels. There's the seraphim with their wings that guard the altar, right? Yeah. From the midst of the fiery stones. I like that idea that that's heaven. Nice. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Okay. So everybody's going to gazing. Oh, look at the king of Tyre. How the mighty have fallen, right? This judgment isn't just of Satan, but it's all who engage in the means and methods of Satan, right? Deceit, that's his main method, right? But the ways of this world, all these kingdoms I will give you. So earthly kingdoms, that's part of it, right? Majesty, glory, earthly glory, right? Like you're talking about impressive things, wealth, power, you know, all the stuff that you wish you had that the elite have, right? Don't, you don't want it. You don't want that power. What did, uh, what did uh, 
Prosper, no, it's not Prosper of Aquitaine. Who's the guy who said with great power comes great responsibility? And no, it's not Spider-Man. Who said it before him? Well, his uncle said it. Okay, not Spider-Man's <laughs> uncle. It's Lord something. Some English guy. You don't know who this is? He's, what? With, with great power comes, okay. Who said with great powers comes great responsibility? Got it close enough, probably. That's Uncle Ben's quote from Spider-Man. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Wikipedia. <laughs> it's not Winston Churchill. I'm sure a lot of people have quoted it. But it's a truism, right? If you have power, you want to exercise it wisely, right? Or if you have wealth, you want to use it wisely. Well, what's the, the wisest use of wealth? Like Carnegie, just give it all away, right? I mean, he's actually made a better name for himself than any of the other magnates that had the robber barons, right? You know, when you think of Rockefeller, do you think, what do you think of? Yeah, Big Pharma, actually. Well, anyway. Or, uh, yeah, anyway, we don't have to go through that. All right, so you defiled your sanctuaries. Whose fault is the san- that the sanctuaries that he set up, these false places of worship, are defiled? It's his own damn fault, right? Yeah, he defiled it, right? How? By your sins. The multitude of your iniquities, the iniquity of your trading, Right? You are a cheat, a liar, a thief, right? Backroom business deals, mob boss, whatever you want to call him. Make sense? Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you. So he was devoured from inside. Yeah, I mean, there was a, oh, I don't know. The Wagner group came after him. Oh, we only got 125 miles away. Let's go to, let's go to Belarus instead. And now, guess what? We have a whole group of soldiers... 25,000 soldiers, mercenary soldiers, former prisoners, in Belarus, closer to Kiev than they were before. Huh. Oh, but it was a coup. Ah, people are so stupid. I include myself in that. Yeah, we fell for it, didn't we? Yeah. It devoured you. It turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who knew you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. I mean, isn't that the worst, how the mighty are fallen? You just see, like, what a despicable, you know, you spent, you had all those decades serving in Congress, and this is what you've become, right? And all we can do is just say shame, and and we recall and recoil in horror of what has become. Maybe it was true all along, we just didn't know it, right? But there you go. So that's Tyre. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Tyre. Dorothy, don't play with the garbage can. I know it's fun to push the button and watch it open. I want to be a child, right? Be amused by such things. I'm going to have to move the camera because I think I'm off camera. All right, Sidon, next. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Sidon and prophesy against her and say, Thus says the Lord God. Behold, I am against you, O Sidon. I will be glorified in your midst, and they shall know that I am the Lord. When I execute judgments in her, and am hallowed in her, for I will send pestilence upon her, and blood in her streets. The wounded shall be judged in her midst, by the sword against her on every side. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, scroll up. And there shall no longer be a prickling briar or a painful thorn for the house of Israel from among all who are around them, who despise them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord God. All right, I guess we shouldn't go on yet. It sounds like it's going to change. All right, so Sidon. Sidon just falls under the same judgment as Tyre. Why is that? Okay, it's corrupt. Same kind of corruption. Good. What else? There you go, Dorothy. It's part of the same kingdom. Right? So the king of Tyre falls, so does Sidon after, her, after him. All right? And uh, a little bit different, though, judgment. The Sidonians, uh, that would be Jezebel's home, homeland, right? Her father was the king of Sidon. Yeah. And who's against her? I am against you, O Sidon. I will be glorified in your midst. Now, when we think of glory, we think... Pretty, but this is the glory of God destroying his enemies. 
So maybe our definition of glory is a little bit off kilter, right? They shall know. Notice that's how it always goes. The word of the Lord came to me, right? Right? And then they shall know is always the conclusion. But what Lord do they know? Well, no, the Lord who brings weal and woe. Right? I often said this, you don't want God as your enemy. Don't make God your enemy. That's kind of like the lesson of the gospel. Receive God as, as he wants to be known, that is, in the forgiveness of sins, through his son, Jesus Christ. But if you don't know his son, you don't know him as father, first problem. If you don't know him as father, then what kind of God, God are you going to have? Terrible and wrathful, angry, judge God. Not a father who loves his children. So trying to, trying to know God apart from Jesus only results in hate, actually. You hate God. You can't love God. You can't love that God. Because he's like Odin, basically. You know, he's generally just kind of mad and kind of capricious. And sometimes you just have to appease him by killing your children. <laughs> that, I mean, if that doesn't describe the religious life of a lot of people today, right? Where are all the white kids at? <laughs> They're dead. Also the black kids. Also the, not as many Hispanic, but, you know, 100,000 children a month. A month in our country. You know, so you're talking millions a year. And that's been the case for, so. Uh, it, maybe less now than there were, but less that we know about because now you can just kill them with a pill and never tell anybody. Over the, uh, through the mail. Here, have a pill to kill the child in your womb. Whew. Wow. Uh, what are we talking about? That's terrible. Oh, yes, he will let us know. I will execute judgments in her and am hallowed in her. So it's all, all right, God's name is holy, but if it's not made holy, then what does he do? He makes it holy. How's he going to do that? Going to get rid of anything that doesn't hallow his name. Every, anyone and everything, right? Including the kingdom of Sidon, the town of Sidon. And how does he do that? Pestilence upon her, blood in her streets, the wounded be judged in her midst, the sword against her on every side. And then, again... They shall know that I am the Lord. All right? So which Lord do you want to know? This Lord? I mean, this is the Lord, same Lord. Or would you rather know him by way of his son who died for you to forgive you your sins? Who sets aside your transgressions, your iniquities? All right? Well, yeah, this is going to be the only Lord that our country knows because this is what we're experiencing right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could say that there are plenty who just don't fear God at all. Not even atheistic. It's not that, it's not that at all. They just act as if there is no God. Right? The fool, the, yeah, the fool says in his heart there is no God. That's the way. The, right. And we are receiving pestilence. Or you might say it this way, that God doesn't judge us based on our actions. He does. Right? We're not saved on the basis of our actions, though. Thanks be to God for that. Right? We're saved by faith. But the judgment of the law comes on the basis of works. Right? And then what, how does God's law judge us according to our works? Every one of us. Guilty, right? Falling short of the glory of God, to quote the apostle. And she doesn't know that, but she will at least know God according to his law. Right? Um, but why would God do that? And then you have this little note, right? Just a, a nice little note. There shall no longer be a prickling briar or a painful thorn. Back to, where do we hear about thorns and thistles? No. You were in? Uh, in Eden, the Garden of God. Yeah, so we're back to that theme, right? Sorry, I have to work on the Wi-Fi. It's a little slower here. I'm not sure that Wi-Fi point is working again. I might have to check that. <laughs> There's lots of things to work on. <sighs> Maybe it'll be cooler this week. Yeah. Uh, so God is removing the briars and the thorns, i.e. the nation, the unbelieving nations around Israel. So this is kind of like uh, farmers do this, right? I mean, when you first, when you first uh, none of you did this, right? Where you homesteaded here and you had to clear the field in order to plant. <laughs> that was a while ago, right? Yeah. People still clear. I suppose we, they, were, they were clearing some trees over off of 144, that property, right? Back there. I don't know what they were clearing it for. Anybody know? No. Yeah, I don't know why they were doing that. Um, but he's doing the same thing here. He's removing the, 
these other nations. Of course, they're in exile at the same time. So he's, he's like, he's clearing the whole land and it's going to lay fallow, right? And then when they come, then they, he'll restore them again. But those nations that were a burden to them will be removed. Got it? Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, from all those around who despise them. And then they shall know, I am the Lord God. All right. And then, oh, we don't want to forget some gospel, finally. <laughs> well, I'll put it all the way up at the top. There you go, so you can see it. What do you think, Mike? Do we need it higher? You told me. I didn't know how high. I had to move this all the way over. I mean, it's not bad. I can see pretty good back the bottom back here, so I didn't know. It's just the bottom of the screen that's the that's question. Bad, yeah. The top, if you can't reach to the very top, I don't know if it's actually a problem. So what do you say? You have like an inch or two? I more an inch. Yeah. I mean, that's not a lot, but it's something. Okay, anyway. I'm asking because you're sitting there. Thus says the Lord God, when I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered and been hallowed in them in the sight of the Gentiles, then they will dwell in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob. And they will dwell safely there, build houses, plant vineyards, yes, they will dwell securely when I execute judgments on those around them who despise them. Then they shall know, now this is Israel, right? I am the Lord their God. The God who restores them, right? Who brings them back and gives them to dwell in safely. Guys, do not play with the doors. Okay? Don't do the doors. I don't think she understands. But we'll, we'll see. So we, this is one of those few brief moments of gospel respite, right? We haven't had much so far. But yes, Tyre, Sidon, um, we had the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites. Who did we miss that we already had? We went through a whole bunch of them here in the, so far, all these nations. We've had six, and then we're going to get one more, Egypt, the seventh nation to be judged of the Gentile nations. We have the Philistines. Oh, Philistines. Yeah, don't forget the Philistines. All right? Yeah. They're all judged, cleared out, if you like, to make room for, for God. And again, they're judged not because God didn't make them or he doesn't cause the rain to fall upon them or the sun to shine upon them. He does all that, right? Gives them food to eat, right? Just like he does the birds of the heavens and the, the, and the flowers of the field. But it's because they've rejected his word. It's because of unbelief. All right. And what happens when you dwell in a land of unbelievers? Well, God, God willing, no. But they are, like we heard there just a few verses back, they're like a prickling briar and a painful thorn, right? Uh, maybe that, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder if that, I always took Paul's statement about, about the thorn in his flesh as referring to his bodily, as to a bodily ailment. And I usually thought it was his blindness. Yeah, because he has to write in big letters because <laughs> he's blind. Why would he be blind? Oh, yes, he was struck blind. Hmm. Who struck him blind? So Jesus did. If he saw, that means faith, not physical. Right, exactly. He was seeing again by faith, and he had to be led around. That's why he always had a companion. Maybe. I mean, you always went two by two anyway, but still. So he was blind Yeah, it's, a, it's just a theory. Yeah. Speculative. But, um, but maybe, I mean, we do describe people as a thorn in my side, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> So maybe he's referring to a continual opposition to the gospel preaching that he's doing. Somebody in the parish or outside. Who was, who was the silversmith that was his pro, always had a problem with him? Oh. Beware of, what's his name, the silversmith. It's at the end of one of the letters. Because The silversmith didn't like Paul because guess what silversmiths make? Yeah. Idols, that's correct. <laughs> so they were, they were very much opposed uh, to Paul. Beware of him. So he says that he prayed to the Lord three times to take this thorn from him, thorn in the side. Um, and the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my, per my strength is made perfect in weakness. Yeah. So uh, we can pray that God remove the prickling briars and the painful thorns, right? Even our own leaders. I listened to an interview with uh, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. Do you know this guy? 
running for a Repub Republican. There's like there's a hundred people running for Republican. <laughs> he was a Silicon Valley guy. He wrote a great book. It's called Woke Inc. Talking about the corruption of business by this woke ideology. Great, great little book. It was his first book. Uh, fascinating conversation. Very similar to to Robert Kennedy Jr., who's a Democrat candidate. Maybe. <laughs> I don't think either of these people are going to be allowed to make it to primaries by the parties. So they'll end up running independent. Uh, and they both have a lot of money behind them. So they may actually be able, by going on podcasts and using social media, and cancel us wherever you want. We'll find platforms that won't cancel us. And then you'll find out about them. Because, you know, some crazy pastor listened to an interview and told you about Vivek Ramaswamy. <laughs> You're like, you know, son of, son of immigrants, native born. Uh, but brilliant conversation. Why? Because he just says things how they are, and, um, and he, would, he would be a great, like, it would totally change the dynamic of our country to have a, I mean, it doesn't change all the people in the unelected um, office, you know, all those appointed things and all their bad ideas. But at least, you know, the person that they supposedly answer to might be reasonable, and then that can change some things. It takes, but you have to do, I mean, it has to be piecemeal. You don't, you can't tear down a house overnight. You know, you need another place to live in the meantime, <laughs> right? So we, you don't want a civil war. Nobody wants civil war, right? No, no national divorce. Don't want to do that. No. Okay. Let's not do that. All right. Anyway, so yeah, future blessing. Now Egypt. Uh, when did we start? Who was keeping track? Well, how about we do this? How about we do this? Let's not read this chapter yet. We'll do that next time, but let me give you an introduction. Can I do that? Which is what I gave you on the sheet, basically. All right, so I don't have a sheet. I have to get one. So we'll just, those first couple paragraphs, right? We'll do the introduction, then you'll be ready to go. Oh, it looks different back here. Off axis. It's a little, it's a little, just a little darker up here. When you're this far off axis. Yeah, yeah. I told them I wanted good off-axis viewing, and it is better than the ones over at school, but anyway. So we have the judgment against Egypt. Egypt gets special judgment. Now that maybe makes sense to us, because who, in the Bible even, New Testament, who is the prototypical evil one? Not Satan. Pharaoh, Pharaoh exactly. Right? And that, a lot of that has to do with Genesis, of course, and Exodus. Right? Um, and since the Exodus... Since, remember Pharaoh, all his horsemen, all of his charioteers, what happened to them? They drowned in the sea, right? At God's hand. Egypt, Egypt never recovered. Not surprising, right? It was all your fighting men and your Pharaoh, right? And then there was squab, you know, of course there was going to be squabbles. So what dynasty takes out what family lineage? Um, they never quite take off again after that. They never have that kind of power and influence again. But that doesn't mean they don't want to. Right? So we've already talked about this a few times, the way that... Um, who was the puppet king that conspired with the king of Egypt? <laughs> I know, all these histories. You will learn it. It will take time, but you will learn it. The one that Nebuchadnezzar set up for Judah. Zedekiah. Zedekiah, correct. Yep. Good job, Ethan. You weren't even here for that. Wow. Hey, you kept bringing him up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So he conspires with Egypt, and guess what happens when you conspire with somebody against another kingdom? They also conspire against you. Right? What do they call that? Backstabbing? <laughs> the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So we were allies with Stalin until we defeated Germany, and then Stalin became our enemy. <laughs> like, wait a minute, how that? What? I missed something here. Wait a minute. I thought, I thought ISIS and Al-Qaeda were our enemy, but we made them. We armed them. What? Oh, they turned against us? How did that happen? That never happens. Lots of sarcasm here. I'm sorry. Uh, Egypt's always been a mortal enemy. So that conspiring with Egypt is like, I don't know what, it would be conspiring with Soviet Russia for us. Um, now, of course, we don't have a mortal enemy like that anymore, I guess. I don't know. Who's our mortal enemy? I guess it's Russia, kind of, maybe. Not really. We still want them to use the U.S. dollar. So how big of an enemy is that? You can use our currency. We'll freeze your assets. What? Oh. So we don't really have an enemy like that probably anymore, um, which is to certain people's advantage, I suppose. Egypt's that mortal enemy, even though they haven't been for a while. 
And um, so they get special acknowledgement. This is, of course, like what we saw, where we had judgment against the Philistines, even though the Philistines had long ceased to be any kind of important enemy. Really, since David's, David's uh, slaying, what was it, 30,000 or something? The Philistines had been a non-player for a long time on the world scene. I mean, you had the, the king of, uh, where was it? What was the kind of capital city? That's rain. Yay! Uh, whatever, the capital city of Phil. What? Uh, well, somebody asked, should I, leave the, should I leave the sunroof down so that it rains? Or should I put it up and then it doesn't rain? He asked, somebody asked on Facebook. I thought it was pretty clever. All right. Um, anyway, the Philistines have been a non-player, but they still got a judgment, acknowledgement. All right. And we had the same thing, I think, really with the Edomites and the Ammonites too. All right. Tyre is judged after Nebuchadnezzar by, by Alexander, Sidon as well, by Nebuch- Sidon by Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar conquers Sidon. All right. So, but now Egypt gets, uh, what did I say here? Seven. <laughs> they get seven oracles against them. Yeah. Now, had, we've had seven nations that have been judged, Egypt being the seventh. Then Egypt itself will get seven oracles against it. Um, and this idea of having seven oracles of judgment is not unique to Ezekiel. You'll see it in Amos chapter 1 and 2. And then Jeremiah 46 through 49, same idea. Seven oracles of judgment. Uh, and perhaps as a reflection back to Deuteronomy 7, uh, where before that God tells the people that they will conquer seven nations. This is also where the White Stripes get their song, Seven Nation Army. He's kind of a, I think he was raised a Baptist, actually. Jack White, yeah. Well, I mean, Bible Belt kind of guy, Nashville, all that. All right. Anyway, Seven Nation Army. You know, you know that song. You hear it at all the ball games. A note about the seven oracles, which we're not going to look at, but we'll do this next time. The, uh, they're generally in chronological order, except for two and three. So the first oracle is the oldest. So it's about 10 years after Nebuchadnezzar um, lay siege. Or no. Ten years after, what did I say? Uh, I wrote it down. King Jehoiakim in 597, the exile. Remember where he gets his eyes plucked out and all that? And then, um, so it's ten years after that. Two years after, or about a year after the siege of Jerusalem. And two years before the city falls. So that's where the first oracle comes. Then the second oracle jumps to the end. So it's the, it's the close, it's the latest. And that's where we hear about the failed siege of Tyre, actually. Um, and you, there's a parallel text in Jeremiah 37, which we could look at. Um, Ezekiel doesn't name the Pharaoh that we're talking about, but I think through most of this, um, Hophra is the guy, or Ap- Apres in Greek. He had a Greek name and a... This is, you know the Netflix series about Cleopatra? It was so controversial because they cast a black woman to be Cleopatra, and she wasn't black. She was Greek. Wait a minute, the Greek queen of Egypt? Yeah. Right, so Hophra was a, that was his Egyptian name, but he was, he was a Greek. It's just like the Romanovs. They weren't Russian, they were Germans. They were all born in Germany. And then they, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it's just like, wait a minute, so Russia was ruled by the Germans? Oh, maybe that explains a thing or two. All right. Well, yeah, there were so many blueprints. Yeah, that's why they were. Russia Yeah, correct. Uh, and then, so like I said, Egypt, Egypt had aspirations to be a world power, but it's unsuccessful. And then the weird part, this is the thing that will throw us off, is there's two verses in here, chapter 29, 13, and 14, where God promises a restoration to Egypt just like he promised to Judah. In the midst of these seven oracles of judgment, there's a promise that Egypt will be restored. Right? Many Christians in Egypt. So... Oh, maybe though, I would suggest it's this. It's the Gentile inclusion of, into the people of God, into the new Israel of Jesus, right? So even Egypt can be brought in to the people of God. Of course, we already had that in Genesis and Exodus because Moses married in a, well, a Midianite, right? 
But uh, we have all sorts of Egyptians that come out of Egypt with God's people. Right? So we see this Gentile inclusion all through the Bible, if you pay attention for it. <laughs> if you don't get so xenophobic, right? So there you go. All right, so we'll start looking at those oracles next time. Uh, any questions? Oracles of Judgment. By the way, when we get through all seven oracles of judgment, then we get to like seven, eight chapters of gospel. Yay. And it'll all be worth it. It'll all be worth it. You'll be like, oh, finally, right? <laughs> Lord, were you going to be silent with us forever and never promise us anything good? Right. Yeah. He does. It's like there's always Easter after Lent, right? You just have to make it through this, you know, seven weeks because you get pre-Lent even with us. I make it extra miserable for you. All right. Works? Nice? Yeah, thanks to you all for supporting that work. It's big. It's very big. Okay, nobody wants to move because they're all so warm. <laughs> if I shut off the screen, will that convince you? Go now. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. Go away now. Thanks, Mike. Yeah.